Thank you, everybody. <laughs> well, it's good to be here, and it's great to see a really good turnout today. So there must be something special about Friday afternoon, Renee, so we better hold on to that time slot. And as she mentioned, this is about uh, the third or fourth in an eight-part series that we're doing on what NASA is up to. So we've done the history of NASA, 60 years of NASA history. We did the eclipse, which everyone, I hope, is getting ready for uh, in October of this year. We'll have a partial solar eclipse. And then in April, we'll have the full uh, eclipse right here in Rochester. So we're preparing for that. And just on that note, I wanted to go ahead and show you this picture right here. This is from one of my satellites. It's a geosynchronous satellite that watches the Earth. And it's a weather satellite, so you can see the weather. But what else do you notice in this picture right toward the evening? You're going to see the shadow of the moon streak across the Earth. So this satellite actually caught the solar eclipse as it went across South America. So that was in Jul uh, December of 2020, and it went right across Argentina and Chile. And I actually, during my eclipse video, I show the reaction of the crowd as the eclipse comes across. It was, it was just a wonderful, amazing event for them. But here, we're here today to talk about James Webb, December 23rd, 2021. Happy birthday, Webb. So we have been on orbit for over a year. We launched, of course, on Christmas Day, uh, 2022. Man many of us uh, science nerds got up early at 5 a.m. on that Christmas morning to cheer it on, and it was just a flawless launch. So we're here to have the discussion of what this year has meant in science and what this amazing instrument is able to do for us Maybe do a little history, and these are our learning objectives. We'll do a history of NASA telescopes, which includes some of my telescopes that I worked on. We'll, we'll talk about James Webb and the observatory as a whole. We'll talk about the mission of James Webb and the fact that we have finally completed cycle one. Cycle one now transitions to what we would call cycle two, which is the second year. And we have a whole new slew of targets for the Webb Observatory in the next uh, year of cycle two. And then we'll talk a little bit about the future plans because of course they involve things going on right here in Rochester. So we wanna take some time to look at those. You know, we are sort of in the golden age of telescopes. Uh, you can actually go out on web, on the web, World Wide Web and buy a fantastic, you know, 10, 12, 14, 16 inch telescope for a very reasonable amount of money because we are in the time when astronomy is certainly mainstream. Uh, when I was a kid in 1948, I wasn't a kid then, but soon after that, uh, they built Mount Palomar, which was by far the largest in the world, it was a five meter telescope that's extremely 200 inches across that mirror, built in Corning, New York, by the way. And uh, it was put online in 1948, and it was the world's largest for 50 years. We had that telescope out in, in California, right out to the south of LA on Mount Palomar, and it was the largest for a long time. 
Then it came along the VLT. This was in Chile, and it's uh, eight meters, which is 26 feet. So we've gone from 20 feet to 26 feet in diameter. Of course, the diameter is what collects the light, the diameter of that main mirror. That was in 98. VLT stands for Very Large Telescope. <laughs> okay, <clears throat> astronomers are not that original. Okay, and got to understand, they're just a bunch of scientists. So they're working on the newest telescope, which is 40 meters, called the ELT. Any idea what that stands for? <laughs> Extremely Large Telescope. There you go. I'm not sure what they're going to call the next one. Okay, haven't figured that out yet. Uh, that's going to be massive, 100, over 130 feet. So where do we go from here? Well, there was a scientist named Lyman Spitzer, who during, right after World War II had this brilliant idea that we need to have a telescope in space. Dr. Spitzer was a professor at Yale. He presented this landmark paper, the astronomical advantages of having an extraterrestrial observatory or telescope was a fabulous idea that went nowhere until the National Academy of Science picked up on it and they started a, a committee to build the Large Space Telescope, or the LST we used to call it. Now Kodak was on that committee, so we had involvement in our optics team on that committee. It was a large committee. And uh, for quite a few years they, they uh, massaged designs and looked at various ways to launch this telescope, and then of course NASA finally bit the bullet and established a program in 1968 that would build a telescope and launch it by 1979. <laughs> yeah, we didn't launch it till 1990, which shows you how these programs go. So they brought the Europeans on, the European Space Agency, by the way, that's why we launched from South America for James Webb, because of the European Space Agency. And so we brought ESA on, and they were brought in, especially the German uh, camera makers, to build the imagers for Hubble. However, they couldn't lay them down on the substrate accurately enough, so they came to Gates, New York, to put those chips down. And I, I, it was Kodak that put those chips down on that substrate for the ESA team, and then they put it on, Jim, on uh, Hubble. Of course, uh, N77, people got the brilliant idea that, you know, we need a an, an, an whole great observatories program. We should have satellites that would cover the whole spectrum of light, not just visible light, which, of course, Hubble was just looking at the visible spectrum, that narrow band. And so uh, NASA decided, you know, we'll go ahead and build satellites for all of the wavelengths. And so they established in 77 the Great Observatories Program. So let's look at that spectrum and the satellites, all the way from far on the left, the high energy stuff, gamma rays and x-rays. Well, we had a gamma ray telescope and we had an x-ray telescope. That x-ray telescope, Chandra, again, built in Gates, New York. So uh, we were very intimately involved, Kodak was, in this process. And uh, Hubble being right during in the visible area of the spectrum, there's the Hubble Space Telescope, there's Webb uh, in the infrared, and way out on the right, Spitzer in the far infrared, named for Lyman Spitzer. He's the only man that's had a satellite named for him while he's still alive. That only happened one time. So that's what the decision was. Now, we, it didn't start with these. It started in 1960. In 1960, NASA took on the mission to predict the weather. It was by far the most important mission NASA could take on in the 60s. We needed to be able to watch the Earth and watch the weather, and that's where my team comes in is building telescopes to do this. So that image, in the black and white image up there on the right, that's Tuesday. So what's that big black cloud coming down out of Canada on Tuesday? How did we know what that was and where that was going? We did it by satellite. And so when you turn on the news, 
every time you turn on the news, they're going to say the satellite imagery, and then they'll show you the picture, and that comes from NASA weather satellites sitting out in space, taking a picture of that big, ugly black cloud that made our lives miserable for a few days. So, of course, we did, in 1990, get Hubble up there. And it was launched in April off the space shuttle Atlantis. It has an eight-foot mirror, 2.4 meters, so it's a nice big ob uh, objective on this thing, so it can really reach out and capture some beautiful imagery. We did refurbish it four times because as soon as we got it up there, we found the mirror itself had a huge problem. It was ground to the wrong prescription by accident. So we, the very first refurbishment was to fix that. So you may remember that happened in 91. We sent the shuttle up with the ladies to put, drop the new lens in. It was a one and a half inch lens. That's all it took to fix Hubble. But it was useless without that lens. <laughs> And so they did fix it, and uh, right now it's been operating for 33 years, which is in it itself just a, an amazing accomplishment that we could keep this going for 33 years. And it is on its last legs, Hubble is. So who comes along? Elon Musk comes along, of course. And Elon Musk says, you know, we could refurbish that thing again. You know, that's the beauty of having entrepreneurs working with you, people that think outside the box. So SpaceX is proposing that they fix Hubble again. Just amazing. I did mention Compton, which is gamma ray, and that's what mapped the cosmic uh, background radiation. So you may have seen that picture of the cosmic background radiation, which is important for us, for physicists, to understand the expansion of the universe. I mentioned Chandra, that was in 99, because this was built again by Eastman Kodak. We put together that mirror cell, which is uh, on the right there, and we put together that optical bench, and while at the far end were the X-ray detectors. That is still in operation. In fact, it owns the record for the farthest away exoplanet detection. They were uh, imaging a variable star in another galaxy, and whoa, a planet went right in front of the star. And they were like, what? <laughs> Where did that come from? And they, so that's never been done before, and it was just an amazing outcome to see an exoplanet in another galaxy. Fascinating results. Of course, uh, I mentioned Spitzer, launched in 2003. It's a far infrared telescope. And as a little bit of a hint of how infrared works, it operates at five Kelvin. Okay, five Kelvin is minus 450 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay, so it operates in the most frigid conditions. To operate that low, you need mirrors that are made out of metals, like James Webb. So the mirror is actually made out of a metal called beryllium, which is very stable at low temperatures. So it's a small mirror in, in Spitzer, three, 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 uh, oh, less than a meter, so 33 inches, very small. But they used it forever, over 20 years, or 17 years, and they found 3,500 exoplanets with it. So it's an amazing mission, which kind of leads us up to James Webb. Again, launched on Christmas Day, 21-foot primary mirror. Uh, combined effort, when you're at a $10 billion satellite, NASA alone cannot possibly do that. And so we had a combined effort, NASA, European Space Agency, and the Canadian Space Agency, all involved in this. Uh, NASA building the, the satellite, the Europeans building the the cameras, again, and the filter wheels that go into the back of the system. The Canadians helping out with the thermal shroud. So um, it's not really fair to call it a telescope. Now, we call it a telescope because of the name of the agency that runs it. It's the Space Telescope Institute, Science Institute, STSI. And so we tend to call these telescopes, but truly it's, a, it's an observatory. Because you have everything, it's just, it's the telescope plus all the cameras, plus all the computers that manage all of this, and the, all of the sunshades and the thermal blankets, and of course the, um, 
the solar panels that run everything. So we, we call it a observatory. And uh, to be honest, it's, it's much more, the science is all done in the back. And all the, the, the telescope just create, cuts, c collects all the light. <laughs> and uh, we do all the magic in the back. Okay, so let's answer some questions like, who was James Webb? Well, that's a good question. And we talk about James Webb Space Telescope. Well, Webb was the director of NASA during Apollo. And uh, he was in charge of all the moon landings and up and through 68, just before um, Armstrong and Aldrin landed on the moon. And it, it's quoted saying that he did more for science than any other government official. Of course, you know, now I don't think that's too difficult. You know, with it based on our government officials, but you know, Webb was uh, quite a scientist and a hard driver, and it took someone like him to get to the moon. So they named our telescope after Webb. So what's the mission of Webb? Why is it out there? What is it looking for? Well, number one, and primarily, and where the real groundbreaking imagery is coming from, is to look at the early universe. To look as far back in time, being you know, uh, uh, photons that are coming at us for billions of years to look as far back as we possibly can. Find the galaxies that are at the very beginning of uh, right near the Big Bang. Uh, secondly, they want to look at the development stages of those galaxies. You know, how do they develop and, and how do they come, you know, it, the galaxies actually collide and they combine. And so they want to see and understand the stages of development. And we have been looking at the life cycle of stars because for the first time we could actually see stars being born. And I'll show you some imagery on that. We, we haven't been able to see stars being born because they're always in clouds of dust. And you can't see through the dust. Well, Webb's going to give us a big advantage. It can see through the dust. And fourthly, find exoplanets. Find other worlds and try to understand what they are made of and if there's a possibility of the ultimate discovery could there be life on another planet so that's the mission of james webb those four items so number one how far back in time can webb look you know this is a, a really really important question and we are pushing the envelope constantly on this every month as new imagery comes back and of course we're trying to find galaxies you know get imagery of galaxies as close to the beginning as we can we know there was a beginning 13.8 billion years ago that's what einstein taught us relativity teaches us that Ed, uh, erwin um, edwin uh, hubble taught us that that the the galaxy has this beginning well we want to see what was the beginning like and what were galaxies like at that time? So that's number one mission of Webb. Now, why do we observe an infrared? So here's the infamous Hubble image of the pillars of creation, because there's stars being born inside this dust cloud. Well, when you look at it with JBOC, you can see right through the dust with infrared. So you can actually see the stars being born for the first time. And so scientists are enamored with this kind of result. The fact that we know that this is a star forming region and there they are. The stars are right there being born right in front of us. So uh, the sci the stellar scientists are just uh, astounded by this result. And they're, trying, they're looking for imagery in all of the star forming regions. The closest one to us is in Orion. And if you go out at night, especially during the uh, winter or the springtime, and you look at Orion, you can actually see the Orion Nebula with the naked eye, and that is a star-forming region. So we have an image like this of that that shows the multitude of stars being born in that star factory. So re wonderful results right off the bat within a few months of uh, observation. Now, how do you find an exoplanet? Well, you have to sort of get lucky to find them. You know, we know there is millions of stars. That means there's millions of planets. But the only way you can see one is if the planet passes in front of the star. And when the planet, you're staring at the star, when this, the planet passes in front, you'll see a dip 
in the in the light coming from that star and so that's how you have you you can see these exoplanets now with Webb, we can look at close in stars where we know there's planets and we can actually see the planets with Webb for the first time and so we're detecting them this way and uh, it's, it's wonderful because if that light actually goes through the atmosphere of the planet, bingo, we can then figure out which wavelength is being absorbed by the material in that atmosphere. So our atmosphere is mostly, anybody? We have air in it. What's the second thing? water right we have water and so water will absorb the light and what we do is we look at the curve of the sun that star shining through that atmosphere and we look to see what light is missing and what we're finding is you know there's lots of carbon dioxide some carbon dioxide water methane ozone so there's a lot of material in the exoplanet and we can sort of discover what that exoplanet is like. So fabulous results so far. Now, how do you launch something that's this big? <laughs> okay, JWST, how big is it? We always say it's the size of a tennis court. Now, how many of you were in Rochester in about 2007 when they brought the James Webb mock-up to the Science Center? Does anybody remember that? So a few of us were there. I actually took my mom to see it. She was alive at the time. And she got underneath the thing, and you could walk right under the thermal shroud, and you could look up and, and see that massive uh, mirror up there. And, she, and she's an artist from, uh, from art school, and she goes, you know, this is just like a piece of modern art. It doesn't look like a satellite at all. It looks like some artist put this together. So you sort of had to be an artist to do this. And the kind of artist you need was you had to be origami. That's what you had to be to do this. So here's the origami. We folded it up. The first thing, of course, we deployed with the solar array. And then we deployed the solar uh, shroud. And there it goes. All this, of course, happening in space on the way to its final orbit. And uh, after we deployed the shroud, a backbone then we unfurled actually they put the telescope on its stand and then they unfurled the shroud get to that all of this took about two months so <laughs> this was quite the endeavor and there we go we're unfurling the shroud pulling it out on its uh, beams and again this uh, shroud is less than one mil thick so it's a uh, very, very thin combination of, it's called Kapton. It's a combination of aluminum foil and plastic. We call it Kapton. And it's to keep the sun's rays off the telescope. So we unfold it into five sections. You can see the five sections. And then the primary, or the secondary mirror is put into place. And then unfolding the wings of the primary mirror is the last step. So it took about two months to do all this, and uh, that was actually in the video that la when they did that last step of unfolding the wings, and they had the telescope completely deployed. It took 173 different motions to get that thing deployed. So it was amazing. Now the next question is, well, where is it? It's uh, about a million miles out into space, and it doesn't orbit the Earth. It orbits the sun. So it's locked into an orbit past the Earth that we call L2. It's a specific point in where it orbits the Earth, sort of like geosynchronous orbit above the sun, behind the Earth. And so uh, it you know, basically keeps cool by always facing away from the sun. So how cool does it get? The telescope is uh, designed to operate at 40 Kelvin. So not quite as cold as Spitzer, but pretty darn cold. And uh, we do that by always keeping it facing oh, deep space, because deep space is two Kelvin, and so we keep the telescope facing deep space. 
and behind that solar shroud. So how many people does it take to build a thing like that? Well, that picture right there is the 800 people that were just at Goddard, NASA Goddard in Michigan, Maryland, at the program office. Behind them were 10,000 engineers working on every conceivable component that went into, and by the way, there's the model right there that was at the Science Center downtown on East Ave. So that's the, that's the mock-up we had here. They brought it to all the key locations. Now, why did they bring it to Rochester? Kodak did the alignment of the telescope. That was our, our part of James Webb, was to do the alignment. So we went down and in the big vacuum chamber in Houston, Texas, and we, we uh, spent years and years doing the computer modeling to get this to work. In, in, in Houston, we uh, simulated this. Our uh, alignment team simulated it. So when you first turn the telescope on, there's a picture of a star. You're going to get 18 star images. That's one star, 18 of them. Because there's 18 mirrors and they're not aligned. So you have 18 reflected images. So they wiggled each mirror around to figure out which star was which mirror. And then they focused them all so that you get a single star out of it. They were all in focus. So that's just moving them back and forth like this. And then we did a complicated uh, process of which we call a phase array. It's a com complex computer algorithm and we got one star out of it. Okay, so they phased all the mirrors so they overlapped. And that was the Kodak, the Kodak contribution to this, and a super important contribution to this entire endeavor. And this was the image that came down. When this image hit NASA in May of 2022, it just astounded the community. You know, uh, this went out to a bunch of us, and we were just, our, draw, our jaws hit the floor. And it wasn't because of how beautiful that star turned out to be. It certainly was beautiful, but what's in the background over 50 galaxies in the background of that star. And so we were completely blown away. No one expected to see that. And we were pretty, pretty, pretty excited about what that meant for the science that would happen with Webb. Uh, Webb has five instruments on it. There's a picture in the upper right of, the, of one of the chips. That's the infrared, the mid-wave infrared chip. The, they call it MIRI, M-I-R-I. And uh, again, different wavelengths of light. The most important one is this one right here, the fine guidance sensor. How do we take these long images of a star? Well, we take a camera and we center it on one star and we lock it on so that the camera controls the, the thrusters on the satellite. And so when we lock it on, the camera will not let that star go more than one pixel off its position. And it controls the satellite for however many minutes, hours. One time we did that with, uh, with, Web, or with Hubble for seven weeks. <laughs> we looked at one spot for seven weeks. We, by the way, we looked at the same spot with Webb and it only took eight hours for the same result. <laughs> anyway. How did it do? Okay, so there's Spitzer on the right, on the left. There's Webb on the right. You can see for yourself what a massive improvement it was to go from 30 inches to 21 feet in diameter. Now, it hasn't been an easy ride. Okay, uh, <clears throat> Webb has had its issues. And so we'll talk about the very first one of those issues happened right away in May of 2022, we realized something didn't look right. When we were doing that phasing, we took a look at one of the cameras, the near cam wavefront sensor, and we noticed there was a spot on one of the mirrors. And so it had sustained a micrometeorite strike. It got hit by a BB size meteor. And we know it was a very small one because of the energy. We only lost a small spot on one of the mirrors. But it was enough. It went right through the mirror. It had enough energy to penetrate the mirror directly. Now, we know it's also been hit a couple times with really tiny pieces, you know, uh, the, like a fleck, if you will. And it doesn't do that kind of damage. But 
you know, right off the bat, the mirror got hit. Now, it didn't affect performance all that much, but you certainly can see it in the imagery. So they took steps to take that, that uh, aberration out of, they, they, first thing they had to do is realign that segment. It, would, it knocked it out of alignment. So you can see it there in the lower right, that segment uh, in the lower right there. They had to realign that one. So that was the first thing to happen to the system right off the bat. The second thing was in, in uh, August of 2022, they realized that one of the filter wheels was, was showing a high torque on the motor. So we re they realized right away that one of those bearings on the top, and that's what we call the index bearing, which holds the filter in the right place, one of those index bearings was seizing up. And so the German engineers that designed this realized right away, okay, we've got to isolate that fault and only use that very sparingly. And so what they do is they don't roll over that bearing, they go the other way. And they, they get to that position by indexing it in reverse. So the last thing that happened, this just happened in January, we had a fault on one of the instruments near ice and the thing that was scary about that was near ice has that fine guidance sensor which allows you to, to do your imaging. So we can't afford to lose this particular instrument. There's a picture of the instrument in the lab. And uh, it turned out it was basically just what we call data latency. And now you've all had this problem. You know, did anybody try to use their cell phone during the golf tournament? Did you try that? You know, everybody had a bandwidth problem when that dumb tournament was going on because they sucked up all the bandwidth. And so that is a problem on spacecraft. You've, you've got to understand how fast your data is being transferred and you can't go, you know, you can't miss, uh, da you know, data transfers. And so that's what shut it down. It was missing. It was time, we call it timing out. It was timing out on the data. So uh, they fixed it. And the nice thing about these satellites is you could upload data, uh, new software. So they uploaded new software and fixed that and they came back online. So that kind of brings us to what we call the cycle one or year one results. Now again, as I mentioned before, in July of last year, July 12th, we stayed up late midnight and we got these first four images. This was the first one they sent us, the Southern Ring Nebula. And we were just so excited to get this kind of imagery, things, things in this image that we'd never seen before at these wavelengths. The first thing we noticed was, it's how it's so beautiful in near infrared and over in far infrared, the MIRI instrument, we noticed right away, wait a minute, that supernova was a double star that we didn't know that there, you can see them in the, big, in the middle, there's two stars there. And so right away, new science is happening with uh, the first images. Of course, you've seen this one, the Carina Nebula, just an absolute beautiful star formation area, area of the sky in one of the nebulas of the Southern Hemisphere. Um, one of the, the pinwheel galaxy, which in infrared look, doesn't look anything like a galaxy from Hubble. And uh, you can see these beautiful, all of that blue, those are all the brand new stars, the blue stars. So we're seeing uh, an amazing star formation in Pinwheel Galaxy. Of course, some of the most exciting things have been closer to home. So here we have a picture of Jupiter, not something that we normally see. We don't, we don't associate Jupiter in this color scheme. But here, Judy, one of our uh, analysts, um, she's actually not a NASA employee. She's a, what we call a citizen scientist. She's like us. She doesn't work for NASA. But she spends all her time downloading web images off the portal and making these incredibly beautiful pictures. In fact, she, she made this, this one right here. She, she's amazing. And I'd love to learn how to do that. But what's the first thing you notice about Jupiter? that we, we don't normally see. It, it's got rings. In fact, all of the giant planets have rings. And so there's Jupiter with two rings. And we don't see the rings because they don't reflect in visible light, but they reflect in infrared. 
And so there's uh, the first inner planet of Jupiter, and it's in one of the rings, which we totally expect. There's the planet Uranus. Now, of course, we know Saturn has rings, but there's the rings of Uranus. It has nine rings. Uranus, of course, is sideways. It doesn't orbit in, an, in the orbital plane. It orbits North Pole first as it goes around the sun. So that's an amazing picture we got back from uh, Webb. Again, showing the uh, south or the North Pole and how it is also covered with some kind of ice, be it probably methane or some kind of ice. Here, of course, is Neptune. We've seen Neptune from Webb, but this is a picture of Neptune in infrared. So it's not the blue Neptune we're used to seeing. What do you notice right away? Neptune has beautiful rings. Okay, it's a, it, you, know, you can also see four of the moons of Neptune's, and two of the moons are creating the rings. Now, we didn't know that this is what happened until we went to Saturn and we flew by the moon Enceladus, and we saw the moon Enceladus had these jets coming out of the southern south pole of, Encel of that moon. And it was creating the, uh, one of the outer rings of Saturn, that that's how it happens. What happens? Of course, it's like squeezing a lemon. When you're that close to the planet, the gravity of the planet is squeezing the moon. And in its elliptical orbit, it squeezes it and lets it go and squeezes it. And every time it squeezes it, it's going to squeeze material right out of it. So that's what's creating the rings. Amazing. We're just figuring this out. And it's wonderful to see this uh, again and again every time we go to these planets. Now, we did take a look at a rocky planet for the first time. We've never been able to see a rocky planet. You know, the Earth is a rocky planet. There's four rocky planets in our solar system, right? So I named the Earth. The other ones would be Mars, Mercury, Venus. Yeah, so we did get a chance. Now, what's the problem with them? They're just too small to see. You know, they're, they're, the Earth is uh, just one thousandth the size of Jupiter. So to see the Earth, um, it, you know, that far away, as far away as TRAPPIST-1b is, which is eight, eight million, 800 million light years. No, 800 light years. That's it. 800 light years. To see it, and then to image it is an amazing feat. And so they image it. There's a very crude image of it. You can sort of see, we know that's a direct image because uh, you can see the, the refraction of the telescope. And they then took the spectral response from the atmosphere of TRAPPIST-1b and they measured it and they found out it's completely coated with carbon dioxide. So that's the response we got. So there they are actually doing the science they set out to do. Measure the atmosphere. Now, they're really interested in this planet because these planets are the ones they're hoping to find Earth-like atmospheres. So TRAPPIST actually has five of these rocky planets. Like we have four, they have five, that star. And so they're still looking at the rest of them right now to get data to try to figure out, is there an atmosphere that could support life there? So that's one of the main missions. Now we might as well cover this because this is where the controversy starts right here with Webb. This image rocked the entire science community and it, it was released on July 12th and it is what we call the deep field. And as I mentioned before, it took Hubble seven weeks to image the deep field. It took Webb eight hours to image this. And immediately scientists took a look at this and they started scratching their heads. And they, because they, they can look so far back now, and that was one of the great um, powers of Webb, is <clears throat> they can look so far back in the early galaxy that they're now seeing things that they shouldn't be there, according to their models. Okay. Wait, that should not be like that. <coughs> and so this is a chart of what we call the red shift. So that curve over on the right is the red shift of these galaxies. And it ends at what we suppose is the beginning of the universe. 
you know, the 13.8 billion years ago. That's where the curve ends. And lo and behold, we're seeing galaxies that are in existence at that point. And so they're going, what? Wait a minute. How can this possibly be? How could we have galaxies there at the beginning? So they, they've been searching for <clears throat> the farthest away galaxy they can find. So here's the one that they have currently nominated as the farthest away they could find. Um, I don't know if it has a name. I, I don't remember seeing the name. Um, they imaged it by, with a bunch of instruments. This actually is Webb, but they imaged it with some ground-based instruments. They measured some of the material, the oxygen content uh, that was in this, and they uh, identified that it was 367 million years after the Big Bang. And the scientists are going, no, that cannot be right. There is no way in the world that that galaxy can exist with that frequency of light coming out of it at that time. And so right now, there are literally hundreds of papers being written to try to explain this. We don't know. Uh, most of the anti-Big Bang people are going, aha, see? <laughs> we told you. You know, they're saying, uh, you know, that, that there is the theory called the steady state theory that the universe has always existed. And they're saying, see, it, there wasn't a Big Bang. Of course, Einstein would not agree with that. That uh, relativity and, you know, Hubble's expansion constant says that there was a beginning. And so the mystery continues. And right now, uh, you know, we look at something like this and we realize, wait, that has more stars than the Milky Way in it, that particular galaxy right there. In fact, there's more main yellow sequence stars, like our star in it. How can that possibly be? Other than, of course, we have the theologians saying, yes, yeah, see, that's, uh, that is what the Bible says, that all of that began all at once. And so we have quite an interesting controversy going on. And it's, uh, it's fascinating for us science types to listen and hear each uh, person come up with their own ideas. And so our controversy right now is that fully formed galaxies actually do exist very early, early, early in the origins of the universe, and no one knows why. So, you know, Hubble or Webb has certainly opened up a Pandora's box for physicists and cosmologists, we call them cosmologists, people trying to explain the stages of development of the universe. We know it began at a certain time. We know it has these parameters that it exists, you know, gravity and the expansion constant. We know it's fine-tuned, but why? We don't know. So that's where we stand right now with, Hub with the web. We're going into what's called cycle two. I just this morning got a chance to see the papers presented for cycle two. And so there is a lot more observations of this kind of uh, uh, target to try to explain what is going on here. You know, how did these galaxies form so quickly? And how are these main sequence stars that we think are billions of years old, how could they possibly be there? So we, we've got quite a lot of work to do. But that is why we've launched these instruments. We do that because we want to try to understand the science and get the data, and we're going to spend years analyzing this data. It'll be exciting over the next few years as we get more and more of this kind of data back, and we try to understand the, the way stars are formed, the way galaxies are formed, and you know, see as far back as we can. In uh, one of the things we want to do is we want to look more at the spectral data from these galaxies and try to understand what kind of stars are in there. So there's a lot to be done in this next cycle, cycle two coming up. We have about 5,000 hours of imaging time on web. There were 38,000 hours of proposals made <laughs> against the 5,000 hours. So everybody is by far the most oversubscribed satellite out there. So it is by far the, the most interesting data sets we're getting back of any of our satellites. And we're pretty excited to see where this goes. 
So let's talk about the future. Finally, ladies, we get a satellite named after Nancy Grace Roman, who was the NASA head astronomer for uh, 30 years. In fact, she ran the Hubble program, Nancy Roman, and one of the leading stars of the NASA program to uh, obtain this data. So they named it the next telescope after her. It's going to be launched in 2027, and it's made here, right in Rochester, New York. So there is a picture of the primary mirror, and I worked on it. There's one of our inspectors inspecting the primary mirror. And uh, so we're excited to see that go. And, you know, uh, it'll go down to NASA uh, in next year, and they'll build it to put it together and hopefully have it up on orbit in 2027. So that's the next big step for us to get uh, better science out of, uh, with Nancy Grace Roman. Now, they're gonna uh, <clears throat> produce another X-ray telescope called Lynx. It's actually got bigger mirrors, not going up till 2036. There'll be another visible, another Hubble, if you will. That's that one down on the right. And right now it's called LUVOR, and there's a big campaign to, be, to have it named the Carl Sagan Space Telescope. That's the, you'll be seeing scientists fight about that. Uh, so that's that one down on the right. It sort of looks like James Webb, you know. And uh, it's going to be uh, all sorts of instruments. It's going to have ultraviolet. It's going to have infrared. It'll have visible light. So it'll be a, a, ut a high utility instrument. Right now it's scheduled to be uh, twice the size of wet, so right around 15 meters in diameter, or around 50 feet, if you can imagine. So that is what's gonna happen in the future. And a lot of us would like to, you know, to sort of hold on for that and be around for that. But we're extremely excited to be around for the data coming out of Webb. And uh, right now, we're extremely excited about April 8th. Because on April 8th, right here in good old Rochester, New York, we're going to have a total solar eclipse. So that's probably what we're going to see in Rochester, that one there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> It'll probably be like that. In fact, I have a whole chart in my eclipse program about the weather at that time of year in Rochester because uh, it's probably got a 60-40 chance of getting a clear sky. However, I gotta tell you, uh, on April 8th of this year, it was beautiful. It was crystal clear. I got the telescope out, put the solar filter on, took the imagery of the sun for my eclipse presentation, and boy, I'll tell you, if we could get a year like that here next year, a day like that, we would just be ex so excited. So I hope you can enjoy uh, join an eclipse party nearby. In fact, we're, we're talking about having the campuses of the schools in this area uh, provide uh, watch parties. A lot of the libraries will have watch parties. Certainly the Science Center, our astronomy uh, organization in Rochester, Rochester Academy of Science, we're putting on a watch party. So please find a watch party next April and enjoy this event. It's truly once in a lifetime. So I hope you get the chance to see it. Now, before we leave, any questions about any of these topics? Yeah. April 8th is my wife's birthday. Wow, congratulations. And my four adult children, ages 34 to 46, all four of them have gotten together Ah. And already got a place for people to stay. And they've been talking to the eight European B folks. So this is more of a warning. Right. They expect 350,000 people to come. Exactly right. That's not us. Right. Double the population of Rochester. So Oops. No problem. <laughs> Waiting for the eclipse. You got to turn the lights out. <laughs> Oh, good. The big point is driving that day. Right. Be really, really yeah. Um, we're going to be in SOTUS. Oh, good. In the lake yeah. Like uh, and it's been suggested that we go up a day or two in advance. Right. Because the New York State Thruway was probably going to be 
So we're hoping, we're hoping to get the school system to take the day off. We're, we're talking to the schools to try to get them to, or at least half a day, so we can get the buses off the road, so that we don't have that blockage that we're, we know we're gonna get with everybody trying to drive. Yeah. Great. Well, that's good to know. It's at between 2 o'clock, 2.10, and 3.50, 4 o'clock in the afternoon. So we're hoping that we can get everybody on site to their watch party well ahead of that, throw a lunch, get, you know, get everybody with their eclipse glasses. So if you don't know where to go to get eclipse glasses, your libraries will have them. The Science Center already has them. And we'll have over 25,000 pairs available. Now, that, that sounds like a lot. Like, my wife actually has 2,000 pairs. Well, we had 1,000 pairs last time, and they were gone in no time at all. So please uh, contact your library and get your glasses early on. That's what we'd advise you to do. Don't wait till like, the week before. Because we were constantly getting barraged by phone calls, and I'm sure Central was the same, constant barrage of phone calls looking for glasses. So we definitely encourage you to get them early on. Any questions? Yeah. Right? So the problem is we have this theory, it's based on how gravity works, that how slowly these you know, uh, galaxy should have formed. And we believe it was one and a half to two billion years to form these, gra these galaxies. And what we're seeing is they were there right, uh, right away. And they're all going, wait, that doesn't fit the model. I, I actually, in my other presentation, I have the model. It shows how they formed. And it's all based on how gravity pulls things together. So here's some of the theories. Okay, gravity was stronger at the beginning. All right, well, that's a theory. You know, they, they can test that theory. That's the beauty of that. And so they did test it, and nope, gravity was the same. Okay, that wasn't it. Okay, maybe the speed of light was different. Maybe it was faster. Nope. That would really mess things up. Okay, maybe the expansion constant was faster. You know, there's so many theories, they're throwing out theories to try to figure this out, and nothing has stuck yet. So, we'll keep working on it. That's all we can do. Okay, there's a theory. That's the steady state guys throw that out right away. They said, hey, it's been there from the, you know. Jim, is there a theory named to being exploding all at once, all the <clears throat> well, we call that everywhere all at once. That is how the Big Bang happened, everywhere all at once. Well, they named the movie after the theory. Yeah, the movie didn't come first. Okay, so the Big Bang was everywhere all at once. So it wasn't at one singular point. Okay, so it, it happened everywhere all at once. But that's a great question. Yes? I have a question about the planetary ring. You said all great planets had rings. Mm-hmm. So, well, they're much, much larger than the Earth, you know, hundreds of times the size of the Earth. And the reason they have those rings, again, is because they accrete, it, you know, they pull in, their gravity pulls material in, and it also pulls on those planets. So the most active moon in the galaxy, or in the solar system, is Io, the moon around Jupiter, and it's constantly blowing up. It's about over a hundred volcanoes constantly spewing material out into space. And actually, in some of the, they, I just read a, an article this morning, they found an exoplanet that has a tail on it. And they realized it's very close to its star and the star is just crushing the planet. And its material is just streaming out of the planet as it goes around the, its sun. And that's what these, that's what these are, these uh, rings. They're material that has strewn out of these moons. And when we got to Saturn, we actually flew through the material to try to figure out what it was with the Cassini mission. I was curious because you said some of the rings are all invisible. Right. So um, for some reason, I thought Neptune and Uranus were both inside the Earth. 
No, they're much, much larger. Yeah, that's good. Question? Someone raised their hand. Yes. Right. Yeah, it was a surprise. Most of it is around the Earth, and it's very hard to predict the not Earth generated stuff. So that comes usually from comets, okay? They spew out material as they come by, right? The tail. And so we get these tiny little flecks that are just kind of out in space. So our really our only defense is we actually, we got to turn it around or turn it sideways to the material. If we know we're going to fly through the material, we, we got to turn it sideways so we have less of uh, a uh, perspective of material hitting it. Now, with this little BB size particle that hit the, the, the laboratory, we had no idea it was even there. So that, that was when it was near the Earth. When it's a million miles out, it's a lot less subject to man-made stuff. Thank goodness. But you're always going to get the space debris that's out there. Yes? They are tracking about 50,000 objects by radar uh, down to a size of, you know, a grain, you know, pebble. But this was smaller than that. So it's hard to track the little tiny pieces. And of course, some countries that have, you know, that shall not be named, Russia, China, they tend to blow things up to prove that, hey, we can blow stuff up in space. And so they do that. And of course, when you blow something up in space, it creates thousands of these man-made particles, tens of thousands. And it's very hazardous. In fact, stuff hits the space station constantly because of it. Yeah, comment back here. Yeah. So, sure, you can actually go to the Space Telescope Science Institute, STSI, and you can look at the uh, web page, and you can see what the calendar is like. You know, what are they looking at? And uh, they have the five, there's 8,000 hours in a year, just nominally. By the way, you only work 2,000, so don't, you know, we, we work 2,000 of the 8,000. And so we, the, but the satellite works all 8,000. <laughs> okay? And they reserve some of it for calibrating it and for maintaining it. And then occasionally you're going to get some really cool thing happen. So does anybody know the really cool thing that happened last week? There was a supernova, okay? And it was in the pinwheel galaxy, the one we just showed. And that is a really cool target. So man, if we can get Webb to image that, we can get some really great science out of, you know, the, what kind of supernova was that? And what's the spectrum of the supernova? And, uh, you know, why did that supernova happen? Maybe we could start answering some of those questions. So we reserve some of the time just for that, about 500 hours, actually. So that's how they divvy it up. And the science community gets quite a chunk, 5,000. That's a lot. So you have to have a really innovative proposal <laughs> to get an hour of imaging time on web, really innovative. So we love to, you know, why did they approve certain proposals? Was it the actual name of the proposal? <laughs> you know, was it a really cool name? Uh, no. Okay, so there were science teams that came up with really crazy names. The, one was called Meow. That was one of the proposals. And we're thinking, you know, another one was called Bees. I thought that was a hilarious one, B-E-E-S. Anyway. Uh, no, they, they're actually looking for what science can we do. The, obviously, that's what they're going to approve. Yeah? First of all, it was fascinating watching the web. You know, Wasn't it? Do everything. Incredible you stuff. How much time you spent watching that. Yeah. How everything <clears throat> actually worked. It was amazing. Uh, but I want to ask a question. I think you recall there was a rumor about the Hubble telescope the, the, uh, lens. Right. There was. There was. Kodak had, somebody from Kodak had recommended the lens be 
tested for like <clears throat> we, it was five million dollars, but yes, we asked them to send that mirror here and we would do the extra tests that we do on these mirrors and they wouldn't spend the money. Oops, five million dollars. It was actually, we could have done it for less. That was the, that was the figure that was been. Instead of five million, NASA spent 2.5 billion to fix it. So instead of a 92 inch optic, which by the way, you can go down to the Washington and you can see it. So it's down in the Air and Space Museum, the Kodak one. And so you can walk right through and, and, and stand right next to it. I got a picture of me standing next to it. So you can see that and instead of that, they just needed that one and a half inch, which was worth $2.5 billion to put that on there. So yeah. Yeah, Kodak did have the right prescription mirror made, but they didn't use it. Yes, ma'am. It seems like you're spending a lot of resources on telescopes. How is that proportionate to the NASA resources for like, or I'm glad you brought that up. <clears throat> when we do the other topics, man-made ones, like we, we're going to do, I will do, I'll do one later in a couple months on Artemis, the return to the moon. Okay, so... The man programs, it's sort of, think of it as a pendulum. And so we're on the pendulum, we're going back toward the manned missions right now. So in the 60s, that's all, we were, we were all about the manned missions, right? That's, that's the main emphasis. And then we went into the shuttle program in the 80s, and that was a massive, you know, uh, and then of course we built the International Space Station and then the pendulum swung back to what we, we call them robotic missions, where we send probes and robots, and we, of course, we send them to places men could never go, like we send it to Saturn. We sent one to Pluto, <laughs> the New Horizons to, uh, uh, satellite. We sent it to Pluto. Man could never go to Pluto. But we'd send these rovers to Mars, super successful, sending robots out into space and now the pendulum is swinging back and now we're going to land people back on the moon after 50 years. So we do have this back and forth that goes on and uh, of course I'm a robotics guy. I'd much rather spend the money on really cool telescopes. You know, I'm a telescope guy from day one. Let's build bigger telescopes. <laughs> yes. Right. What's the prospect for sighting future space telescopes on the moon? <clears throat> well, that's, that's interesting. I, I don't know the answer to that, personally. Um, the moon, although, you know, people like to say the dark side of the moon, that's a misnomer. Okay, because the back of the moon, the moon is locked in its orbit, always facing the Earth, right? But as it goes around, sometimes the dark side faces us. Right? So the, what we, the back side, of course, would be fully illuminated, right? Because it's shining, the, the sun's shining right at it. So there really isn't any, you know, advantage. And Webb has kind of broken the ground of how they want to do it. They want to go out there way past the moon. There would be an advantage in terms of propellant for stable. Oh, okay. Okay, yeah, yeah. It, it, Life, it, there would be a, a life expectancy advantage, yeah. Because you could just send a guy down and fix it. Right. You could just, and you know, if it gets dirty, you could just blow the dust off. You know, it, certainly I agree with that. Web is only going to be good for 20 years at this point. Now, you know, with people around like Elon Musk, he'll probably come up with a way to fix it. <laughs> you know, send one of his guys out there to fix it. Who knows? But, yeah, that's a good comment. It's going to be the fuel on board, you know, fuel on board. And so the closer you can get to your optimal orbit, the less fuel you get to, you have to use. And the Europeans did a fantastic job getting it into orbit. And it went from 10 years life expectancy to 20, just based on how well they inserted it into its orbit. So we were so excited to see the results of their um, launch. Yeah. All the time. We're constantly moving the thing to get it out of the way. 
Yes. And it's one time, uh, just uh, in January, one went right through the Russian capsule and they had to seal the thing off. You know, what do you do in a situation like that? You know? And so you have to go on a spacewalk, fix the, you know, fix the hole. And, you know, that's why we have epoxy up there. We fix the holes. Then we land it. Yes, they do. Yes, they do. Absolutely. They maneuver it out of the way. Exactly right. They'll take the whole space station and, and float it higher, almost always higher. They do that with thrusters on the spacecraft, not on the station. So they'll send up a capsule and it'll have thrusters and they'll push the station up out of the way. So yes, they have to do that all the time. Now the station, I got a good friend that, was, that ran this program. It has an aluminum skin above the aluminum frame of the station. So when it, when it hits, it hits that skin first and vaporizes the micrometeorite. And so all that you get on the surface of the station is just a bunch of uh, debris. And so they do have, it's, it's the same thing in submarines. We do this in submarines where we have two skins, tanks, it's just consider it like that. It's, a, it's an ablative armor on the spa space station. Now, how successful is it? Well, you know, it can only take a certain size after that goes right through. So, yes, we do have that, and uh, it does work uh, for most of the small stuff. Okay, yes. So that's a great question. So yes, and, and uh, there's entire agencies endeavoring to, what, what our problem is not, it's, it's not people that will listen, it's we have way too much data. We have just way too much information coming at us. So we have to develop computer programs to sort through the data. And that's where we're winding up to, you know, to uh, be, find our answers is to create algorithms that will sort through all of the data that people are listening to. So far, we've seen one. Not yet. Not yet. Because we don't really know what to look for. So right now, we're looking for, uh, usually it's the wavelength of hydrogen. That's the signal we're looking for. And we found it exactly one time so far. We still don't know why we found it. And we call it the wow signal, W-O-W. -W. Now, the reason we call it that is the guy that was looking for it, you know, he's looking at the data, he saw these numbers, and what did he write in the column? Wow. He wrote wow, and he circled the numbers. So we call that the wow. That's the only signal we found in all these years. But we know we've only looked at a tiny, tiny percentage of the signals that we're receiving. That's the problem. So, okay, yes, but think about it. Not, very, very little of our communication gets past the edge of the solar system. Yeah, very little. It's, we don't have high strength signals. You know, you think a TV station is high strength, when you're 10 miles away, it's high strength. But if you're hundreds of millions of miles away, it has petered out to just a tiny, tiny fraction of a billionth of a watt. You know, we just don't put out high enough signal strength from the Earth to, for anybody to hear us out there. So that's the, that is the answer to that question. So right now, it's this, we, we're still looking for that Earth-like thing. And we thought this Trappist one, 800 light years away, was the closest. We thought it was. We're still trying to figure that out. We're looking for those small, rocky planets. And then we want to look at the atmosphere of the small, rocky planets to see if there's one that's, you know, like Earth's atmosphere. So far, haven't found it. But we're still looking. Every time data comes back, we, we're looking at it. Yes, sir. All of it is not in the visible, yes. Oh, I guess, okay, okay, you got me there. <clears throat> I should have put the slide in that shows you how they do it. 
So as you saw that these images, they, they're, there's 17 discrete filters on all of these images, right? And so as that filter wheel clocks around, they're taking 17. Now those are just black and white images, right? Because that's all these are. They're just black and white chips and they're taking 17 different bands and then you have to download that data and on your computer, in your imaging image process software, you assign a wavelength to every one of those. And then you stack the image up and what you come up with is this incredibly beautiful visible image because you've taken that wavelength of, you know, this one way out here and you've assigned it to this one that you can see. And maybe, you know, this blue one, you've assigned it over to the blue. And this one in the middle, you've assigned it to the green. And there we get our RGB image. So that's how it's done. Now, there's a lot going behind the scenes. And that's why those, those citizen scientists are so good at this, especially Judy. She's my favorite. We do run a contest on this if you're interested. You can get the data right off the web. You can make up your own image and submit it to NASA, and I'm one of the judges. And so we, we look at it, we look at thousands of them, and if we like it, we'll, you know, give you, a, you, you know, can enter the contest, we'll give you an award. So, so we're kind of, and Judy, believe it or not, Judy came in third. And I was like so surprised. I said, how could this possibly happen? She's the best. But, you know, people do this. They love doing this, making up images because you, you can tweak the colors and make them incredibly beautiful. But hey, that's not what the scientists are looking for, right? They're trying to do science with it. So it has to be pretty and it has to have scientific value both. So that's not easy to do. Yes, sir. To detect? Dark matter. Okay, yes. So, fascinating topic, you know, what is dark matter? And of course, they're constantly trying to come up with theories of actual, you know, uh, particles that you can detect that would sort of tell us what dark matter is. So yes, of course, uh, more important than that, they're trying to detect black holes because the black holes they realize are are influenced by this dark matter. And so they're using the next cycle to try to detect, you know, uh, directly detect the black holes, which is, we're starting to get better at that. We've actually imaged black holes. So now we know what they look like and what are they doing? You know, how are they creating this gravity well that creates this galaxy? That those are some of the questions, but the reason that dark matter is so difficult is the size of the experiment that you would have to run is the size of a galaxy. You know, and so my, I, I've got a cousin who's a professor out at Stanford and used to tell me, he said, hey, good luck trying to run an experiment on dark matter because it's just so hum humongous to create that kind of energy. And so anyway, it's... Uh, it's a very difficult question. Yeah, Marty. Yeah, real quick. Uh, you showed up there, and, and I've read a lot about lensing. Okay. And how gravity of the lens. Right. <clears throat> so I did show that in the deep field image, you can see the lensing. So I didn't want to talk about, when I'm talking to engineers and scientists, I will mention lensing. But you can see that there's these galaxies that are curved, right? That's actually only one galaxy, but you're seeing it six times all around that massive gravity well of that galaxy cluster. So we have a cluster of galaxies and the gravity is taking the light from this galaxy, which is way behind it and bending it around. We call that gravity lensing. Now it allows us to see something that's way out there through the gra what we call a gravity lens. So it's magnifying the image. And so you're gonna see those all around that huge galaxy cluster because the mass is just so high there. And so, yes, I definitely uh, agree with you that it's a, a, a very, very important step for us to utilize the uh, ability to magnify 
those images to see the stuff that's right back at the beginning. Yes, sir. It's being, cur the light is coming, it's, it, it would go right through that, ga that galaxy cluster, but it goes around it because of the uh, gravity well. Space is being deformed there. That's what Einstein would say. And it's going around, you know, the light doesn't bend. I sh that's a bad way to say it. It's going straight at us, but space is bending. Right. It's going straight at us, but it goes around that galaxy well because it warps the space right there. Is that a better way? To, that's a better way to understand it. Yeah, it's not, it, it, we call it lensing, but it's, a, it's not really lensing like we would understand a lens. It's more, it's warping the space around the galaxies. Yes, sir. Right. It's a million miles out. It does take 30 seconds to get a signal there. Yeah. Yep, you, you, you need about three or four radios on it. Yes, yeah, they will have triple redundant radio signals. Now, it's only about a 40 watt transmitter on the thing. That's all, that's all it really takes. It's again, a million miles, not that far with a high gain antenna on the side of the thing. And it does, it does take 30 seconds to get here. It, it is a long trip. But by the way, I have a whole thing for the engineers and especially the radio guys about we're trying to use lasers to do it. Because a laser beam contains a lot more information than an elect a radio signal would contain. So we do have a couple of missions up there now, one's on the moon, orbiting the moon, one's on the space station, where we use a laser to get the information down. So uh, think fiber optic, but using a laser. So that is uh, definitely something we wanna try in the future, because this is, it, again, we can take way more images than we can possibly transmit to the Earth with a radio beam. But if we had a laser beam to the Earth, we could definitely fill it all the, you know, bandwidth with imagery. So yeah, that's, that's a key component of this. Okay, well, hey, thank you very much, everyone. Thanks for coming out. And I appreciate your attention tonight. And uh, I'm from, of course, NASA, the ambassadors. And please take a look at the upcoming schedule if you wanna join us for the next topic, which I'm not even sure what it is, Renee, but uh, uh, she's got the list. Planetary missions, September. Yeah, so please come back. We'd love to see you. Thanks again.